on the awesome adventures through the scriptures, and this is part six of um, those lessons. And I'd like you to open with me in your Bible to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And um, as you turn over there, and as you think about it, and I think about the subject of glorious freedom, there is no doubt in our mind that I think everybody here, I don't think there's anybody really from the stock of Israel here. I don't think anybody's got Jewish blood in them that's here this morning. Not that there's anything wrong with it, if you do have. But I don't think, we're all Gentiles, right? Uh, we all were not part of the nations of Israel and not part of the 12 tribes of the nations of Israel. And before the Apostle Paul comes onto the scene and he preaches the glorious message of the gospel of God's grace and he starts off in preaching the gospel of Christ, the gospel of God, which is the good news concerning His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as Gentiles before, we were on the other side as we saw in our, in our studies and, um, uh, and as we came through these last few weeks, um, that in the studies as Gentiles, we were on the other side of the middle wall of petitioning. And then if, if you're in Romans chapter 11, go back with me to Ephesians. Ephesians uh, chapter 2, quickly again there. Uh, we were on the other side of the middle wall of petitioning. And at that time that we were on the other side of the middle wall of petitioning, as we see right through the Old Testament Scriptures, and right through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even in the beginning of Acts, at least to the first eight chapters, or seven, eight chapters of the book of Acts, Gentiles were not in that direct plan of God, it had to go through the nation of Israel. If the Gentiles were going to be blessed, it was going to be blessed through national Israel and Israel having a rightful place in the kingdom and by which the nations of the world are going to be blessed. You and I had to wait for Israel to get saved. We had to wait for Israel to be blessed. We had to wait for Israel to take on a rightful place as the holy, uh, peculiar people of God, a holy priesthood unto Him. But, and, 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 and until then, the situation that you and I as Gentiles had, look at verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Now look at 12 carefully. That's who we were as Gentiles. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was the position of a Gentile in time past. We walked, look at verse 1 of chapter 2 there, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, who in time past, you wa where, where in time past, you walked according to the cause of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of, God, uh, children of wrath, even as others. As Gentiles in time past, you and I were on the other side. We were without God, without hope, without Christ. We had, we had none of the promises made to the Gentiles. Why? Because God, as we looked in our study in this awesome adventure through the Scripture, by Genesis chapter 11, He gave the nations up. And he, after He gave them up because they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful, and they, would, they did the thing what was vain in their own imagination, and they did their own thing. God gave them up, and God chose out of all the, these people of the world... He chose, uh, chose, chose one man, and he was who? Abram, and God says, and he's going to promise him a nation. And we looked at that as we, there's a promise, and, and, and these people that he's going to use to reclaim his authority back on the earth is going to be the nation of Israel. And he's going to set up a king and a kingdom, and he's going to and be a king of the Lord Jesus Christ himself for the nation of Israel. And then the nations of the world will be blessed through Israel. Okay? So as you and I as Gentiles, we could not sing in time past, Glorious freedom, wonderful freedom. Right? We couldn't sing that. Okay, I well, know it's terrible. But that's okay. I'll make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That's all right. We couldn't sing that as Gentiles. But now, the Apostle Paul coming onto the scene, 
And God revealing to him the revelation of the mystery, revealing him the good news concerning his son, and the truth done for you and I at Calvary, now we can sing that song. Oh, and we can sing it vehemently. We can sing it greatly because that's who we are now. We have a relationship with God, and, and there's no more middle wall of petitioning. But until the beginning of Acts, as we saw the last time, there was a middle wall of petitioning. Israel was ministered, uh, had to be saved first, and then the Gentiles of the world, uh, world could be blessed through the nation of Israel. And that's where we came to the last time in our study. We went through the Acts, and, and we saw that the nation of Israel, look at me at, verse, at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. Who's, who's they? The nation of Israel, right? Have they stumbled that they should fall? Was it God's intent for them to fall? Obviously not. But the question is, did they fall? That's the question. God didn't want them to fall. <laughs> God's desire is not for them to fall. But they did stumble. I said, and have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, the second part of that verse tells you that they did fall. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Guess what happened with the nation of Israel? They stumbled. And they actually, God's intent was not for them to fall, but they did fall. And how did they fall? And when did they fall is the question. And I think we answered it last time. I, I can't remember now. But at last the time we said, where did Israel stumble? Where's the blessed place to stumble? There must be something to stumble over. And the scripture tells us there is a stumbling stone. <laughs> and who's the stumbling stone? The Lord Jesus Christ. They stumbled at Christ at the cross. They crucified Him. They rejected Him. And they said, we want nothing... As a nation, I'm not talking about the believing remnant of Israel now. I'm talking about unbelieving Israel wanted nothing to do with their Messiah, where their Christ was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They rejected Him and they hanged Him on a tree. And they say, crucify Him. At that place and at that time, the nation of Israel has not fallen yet. They have an opportunity in the beginning of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. They have an opportunity to repent, to be converted for the remission of their sins, so their sins can be blotted out. And, 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 the, and the response they have to respond to is the testimony of the Holy Ghost that is now testifying that Jesus Christ was very Christ, that He was Christ. And that, and, and that He did die, and that He has resurrected, and all the nation had to do is says, we believe the testimony of the Holy Ghost. Right? But I didn't believe the testimony of the Holy Ghost. Instead, they did committed the sin as a nation called the unpardonable sin. And that unpardonable sin was blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. And that unpardonable sin... As a nation that commits that unpardonable sin, when they commit that sin, that's when the nation of Israel fell, because they cannot be forgiven that sin. They could be forgiven for speaking out against the Son of Man, the Son of God, by hanging Him on the cross. They could be forgiven of that, and they could repent from that, and they could be converted from that, because that's what Peter was preaching in the beginning of Acts. Right? They could, and, and they, but they did not. They, 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 they rejected the testimony of the Holy Ghost. Go with me quickly. And I know I need not spend much time here. Otherwise, we're going to definitely run out of time. And in and, and Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. The Lord Jesus Christ is speaking and He says, verse 31 of Matthew chapter 12. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be, shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, let me ask you the question. When this was written in the book of Matthew, was this all according to prophecy? We have to agree it was all prophecy because the revelation of the mystery was not very revealed to Paul yet. 
right? Christ has not revealed to him the mystery yet. So at this time, it's, it's in prophecy, in light of prophecy, he says, the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Verse 32, And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. Now, did Israel speak against the Son of Man? Yes or yes? Yes, they did. Okay? To the point that they crucify him. That's how they committed sin against him, rejecting him. It says, But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. What was he talking about the world to come? Was he talking about the heavenlies and inheriting the heavenlies as people? Or was he talking about the kingdom that will be established on this earth, the world to come? That's what he's referring to. And if you committed the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, the pardonable sin, you cannot go into that world to come. And as a nation of Israel, unbelieving Israel, they committed that sin in Acts chapter 7 when they rejected the testimony of the apostles and specifically the disciples of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And that's where Israel fell, committing that sin. Now the man that stood at the head of, of the committing of that unpardonable sin, the man that stood at the, at, at, at the head of consenting to the death of Simon, uh, of Stephen, is a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus is part of those that's committing the unpardonable sin. Right there. He's consenting, he's killing, he's making sure that Stephen gets killed. And he's following every other believer of, of the Acts 2 to get them killed. He's committing the unpardonable sin. So there's no way that Saul of Tarsus, who is a Jew by the way, but he's also a Roman citizen, but who's a Jew, and uh, can inherit the kingdom to come. Because he committed unpardonable sin. But the revelation of the mystery was not yet revealed. The secret part of that. And God had to hit that secret in himself. We talked about that before. Okay, I'm not going to expand on that. But he, uh, he, he kept that secret in himself about what he's going to do with the, with, with, with the Gentiles and what he's going to do specifically with the body of Christ. He's going to extend, in spite of the nation of Israel, He's going to extend grace to Gentiles who does not deserve it. And, and, and the pattern he's going to use, the pattern he's going to use is the apostle, or, or is Saul of Tarsus. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And we're going to come back to Romans chapter 11. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now according to Matthew chapter 12, there is no way that Saul of Tarsus who is consenting unto death and is also rejecting the testimony of the Holy Ghost concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, could be forgiven according to the prophetic program, right? But, oh, and but is a big but. That's why we call it the but now, okay? God, and I, and I say this and sometimes people don't like it, but I'm going to say it anyway. But when you see that but now, that's when God kicks some butt. Because if Satan knew what was the revelation of the mystery, he would have never allowed the Lord Jesus Christ to be crucified. But God takes the man that cannot be forgiven according to the prophetic program and according to what Christ says in his own words, takes that very man and he's going to show what it means to be long-suffering, what it means to be merciful, and what it means to be graceful. All right? And he saves that man. First Timothy chapter 1, if you will. Verse 12, I thank, um, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Oh, by the way, Paul didn't deserve to be put in the ministry. <laughs> okay? He got put in the ministry because of what God was doing in him. Who, who was before a, what does he say? A blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am what? Paul was standing right at the forefront of the rejection of the Holy Ghost. He is the guy that's leading the rebellion, if you will, against the testimony of the Holy Ghost. And God, against all odds and all the prophetic word, 
goes out and reveals now the pattern for which he's going to bring salvation. And he's going to save a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And he's going to make, change his name to Paul, the apostle. And he's going to send him with a message of his grace to the world out there and to Gentiles in spite of the nation of Israel. This is how be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Let me tell you, at that stage, by the time the apostle Paul, or the Saul of Tarsus, standing there and consenting to the death of Stephen, and they're putting their cloaks and the things down at his feet, and, he's, and, and, and Stephen gets killed, this man should by no means be, a, be, be, be parted by God, being saved by God, being granted grace. But God said of all pattern of long suffering, and he goes out and he saves the very man that's in the front of the rebellion, and saves him, and puts him as the first member into the body of Christ. The church today. And he says, yes, a new man I'm going to form in spite of the nation of Israel. In contrary to the nation of Israel. And I'm going to form a new body. And to do that, I'm going to have to take down the middle wall of petitioning and remove it out of the way and bring all together in one body in Christ Jesus. So in this dispensation, which is the unprophesied revelation of the mystery, that God hid in Himself, here He brings now a message of God's grace through the preaching of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Right? And preaching of the cross and preaching that He died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to Scripture and that everybody who believes that and believes the testimony of what God gives concerning His Son and puts Him into the body of Christ. There is no more Jew nor Gentile. And Paul is the one that brings this men this revelation. That's where you and I are. And Paul reveals to Paul, uh, God reveals to Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ by direct revelation reveals to Paul, progressively, if you will, progressively to him, reveals to him what is the modus operandi for today. What God does and how He operates today. And the way that He reveals to him is revealing to him the revelation of the mystery. But in the beginning of Paul's ministry, he is still provoking Israel to jealousy. He's going still to the Jew first and then to the Gentile as we see through the book of Acts, the rest of Acts. To provoke them into jealousy. But those, those Jews that now hear the gospel that Paul is preaching and hear the message Paul is preaching, they cannot enter the world to come. They have to believe what? The gospel and so that they can enter, they can become part of the members of the body of Christ. So this is not contrary to prophecy. Uh, let me put it. Let me be careful how I say this so you don't think I'm saying it. This is not a contradiction in God's Word. This is the revelation of the mystery. Okay? Because God has promised from it. He brought Abraham once I, uh, out. He says, you know, I'm going I, I, to bless you. I'm going to bless my seed. I'm going to bless my nation. I'm going to give them a land. I'm going to give them to the, the, the Davidic country. I'm going to give them a king. I'm going to be the king myself as the Lord Jesus Christ sitting on that throne of David. And I'm going to rule of this earth, and I will rule with an iron rod, and I will bless you in this, in this land, and I will bless your land, and I will increase your children, increase your crop, and I do all these things for you, but you will be a holy nation and a peculiar people unto me. You will be the priest of the Most High God. That's who you're going to be. And the nations of the world is going to be blessed through you and by you. Right? But we know that never happened. Is it still going to happen? Is God done with the nation of Israel? Is He says, I'm so done with these guys, i got nothing to do with them? No, He's busy in the process. Go back to Romans chapter 11. He's in the, he was in the process there in the beginning to provoke them to jealousy. But Israel still is going to be saved. Let's read a few verses. Go back to Romans 11 there, if you will. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles. Through Israel's fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. To provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them being the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if Israel did got saved? But they didn't know Israel as a nation. Verse 14 says, or verse 13 says, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, 
I magnify mine office. He's not magnifying himself. He's magnifying his office. That's privileged ground he's standing on to preach to the Gentiles the good news of God, the gospel of God, the good news of God concerning His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, If by any means, verse 14, I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, talking about Jews and Israel now, and might save some of them. There is, he's in the process, he wants some of them to be saved. But even as he goes to the nation of Israel through the rest of the book of Acts, as Paul goes to the Jew first and he goes seeks the synagogues out and everything else, the nation of Israel is still, <laughs> as a nation and as people of as Israel, they are still in rejection. He talks about the diminishing of them in the previous verses there. The diminishing of them. As you go through the book of Acts, you see the diminishing of the nation of Israel and in the ministry to the nation of Israel. He goes and he's preaching and, and, and go a couple of verses. Um, Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 18, and Acts chapter 28. You need to have those three, ver- three chapters in your mindset if you're going to talk about people about the diminishing of the nation of Israel. Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 18, Acts chapter 28. In Acts chapter 13, Paul is now being commissioned, and he's now more longer Saul. He becomes Paul. As he starts out with his ministry... The body of Christ, I believe, if you ask me when did the body of Christ start, I believe the body of Christ started in Acts chapter 9 with the first member, the Paul of the Apostle. But Paul was only commissioned by Acts chapter 13. Okay? But it doesn't mean the body of Christ starts in Acts chapter 13. All right? Um, what was I saying? Uh, verse 46. Paul goes to the Jew first. He seeks out the Jews. He's preaching to the Jews. He's preaching to Israel. And he wants them to be converted, to win some, so they can become a part of this new body that God is doing. Verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's go verse 44. And the next Sabbath day came, uh, day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the, saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Again, they are still contradicting and they're still blaspheming. Okay? Verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourself unworthy to ever, of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Paul is not doing that once in the book of Acts. He's doing it three times in the book of Acts. As you go to Acts chapter 18, he's still in the ministry of provoking Israel to jealousy. He's still in the ministry of, of preaching out to the Jew first. In Acts chapter 18 and verse 6, if you will. Oh, wrong passage. Verse 6 says, and it's talking about the Jews again, and when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I will go to the what? Gentiles. Strike one, strike two, if you will, and Acts chapter 28. God knew about baseball long before baseball knew about baseball. He knew about the issue of three strikes. And Acts chapter 28, verse 28. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. So what do we see here? He's provoking Israel to jealousy. He's preaching to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And in the process that he's moving in through the book of Acts and going to the Jew first and the Gentile, he says, you know, we turn to the Gentiles. We turn to the Gentiles and we turn to the... God's going to send the salvation, His salvation to the Gentiles. Who is making that proclamation? The Apostle Paul. Because that's part of what God wants to let them know, okay? And so, and, and so God gives, uh, the nation of Israel is diminishing away and is now dealing with the Gentiles. And any man in this dispensation that wants to become the part of the body of Christ has to come, how? Does it matter if he's a Jew or a Gentile? Does he get a privilege to be a Jew, to get it first? No, no, no. There's no more privileges. There's no more difference. There's no more Jew nor Gentile. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Those that's formed in the body is one in Christ Jesus. And all have an equal opportunity. 
the church today is preaching for the peace of Jerusalem and is going out to try and get Israel saved and to establish it. You know, they got it all wrong. They don't see what God is doing rightly divided in the revelation of the mystery. And they, because they don't rightly divide, they think the kingdom is here and we need to get Israel established in it. Listen, wait. Israel is going to have to wait for the body of Christ to be completed and to be raptured and be caught up out of this world before God is going to return His program with the nation of Israel. And all those so-called Christians today is busy with this program. They're not going to be here when God gets back with that program to do what they want to do today in place of God. Because they're right, failing to rightly divide the word of truth. You get that? That's important. We get that. Go look. You're in Romans chapter 11 there. Show you a couple of verses there. Verse 25, if you will. Verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, conceit, sorry, that blindness, what is the next word? in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. When will the fullness of the Gentiles be come in? What will be the completion and the fullness of the Gentiles be come in? I believe it's the rapture. Or we call it being caught up. You know, the Bible doesn't use the word rapture. Okay, and some people get their noses out of joint because we use the word rapture. Okay, what I mean is when we get caught up. Okay. And when Christ comes to take us, and He's going to take us home, the body of Christ, to fulfill in His purposes in the heavenly. Because we said to you before, as we're doing this awesome adventure to the Scriptures, everything from Genesis to Revelation is about God wanting to reclaim a throne of authority. All everything in time past with the nation of Israel on the earth, and establishing of the kingdom is to have His throne and control and dominion back under His control and, re and reignship in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth, and the people that he's using to do that is the nation of Israel. That's what your whole most of your Bible is about. The rest of your Bible that takes off a very short, very thin piece of your Bible here is what God is going to do in the heavenly places. That's you and I through the ministry of the Apostle Paul that's going to go into the heavenlies to reclaim his throne of authority in the heavenlies. And that's where you and I are bound. And when he's finished with preparing these people to go up there, you and I, then he will continue with his program with the nation of Israel. He has just in part blinded them. God is not finished with Israel. Because why is God not finished with Israel? Why do you think God is not finished with Israel? Because he's not a man that he should lie. Because he made an unconditional promise and covenant with Abram. That's why he's going to do it. Not because of Israel's faithfulness, but because of his faithfulness. Because his condition and his promise that he made with, 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 with um, Abraham was unconditional. The law covenant was a conditional covenant. But the Abrahamic covenant and the circumcision covenant was an unconditional covenant covenant that he made with the nation of Israel and he has to fulfill that purpose and plan look at, the, at, at Romans chapter 11 if you will, Romans chapter 11 he says verse 25 for I would not brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own conceit that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, by the way it's been 2000 years Paul was expecting that not to last 2000 years in the way in the language that you read that he's writing He's not expecting the Lord to wait 2,000 years, but God knows what He's doing. Verse 26. Then He says, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. They shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall return, every, uh, godliness, uh, shall return away ungodliness from Jacob. When is that? When the, 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 the church, the body of Christ, is taken out. When you and I are caught up. Verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. God loves Israel. He abhors their sin and he, and he, and he despises their wickedness. But God loves the nation of Israel. And, that's, and the reason why God loves them is because of Abraham and the promise he made to Abraham. 
and he's still going to fulfill that. And he's going to process us to do that. That's why the rapture could not possibly be taken place during what God is doing with the nation of Israel. It has to proceed before he goes back with his program with the nation of Israel. And you and I will be caught up and will be taken home. Romans 2, 5, even gives us the information that you and I need to know concerning what God is doing today. As you look at the book of Romans to, to Philemon, God lays him out in such a perfect, beautiful manner as, as God is building this, the, this body today, in this church today, the body of Christ, with Jesus Christ as the head, you and I as the members of this body. Okay? As he's going through Romans to Philemon, the book of Romans to Philemon is laid out in such a way for us that we can see the edification of this building that he's putting up. The foundation that he's laying for the building is what? It's the finished work. It's other foundation can no man lay, which is laid, which is who? Jesus Christ. The foundation is the cross. And it's the finished work of the cross. And he lays it out, the finished work of the cross for us in the book of Romans. Right? Romans, First and Second Corinthians, and the book of Galatians deal with the subject of the cross. And the foundation he lays with the cross. Then we get to the book, and once this foundation is laid about the finished work and justification of a faith issue, not by the works of the law, but by the faith of Christ, and how we should behave, Corinthians, as, as believers, concerning that gospel that we learned about the cross, the foundation has been laid. Then when we get to the book of Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, he's now finished with the work of the cross. He doesn't have to reestablish that work and relay that foundation again. It is laid in Romans to Galatians. Now what he's going to do, he's going to build, he's going to talk about his church. Now the walls are going up. And the inner walls are going up. And this is the church, the body of Christ. And Jesus Christ is, is the head of this church. Your and my head is not the Pharisees, it's not the Sadducees, it's not the scribes, it's not the priests, it's not anybody but the Lord Jesus Christ himself is my head. And he's the head of the body, which is the church. And Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians deal with this body, the church. The advanced doctrines from Romans to uh, from Romans to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians is advanced information. It's information that's built upon Romans, Corinthians, and Galatians. And then we get to the to the book of Thessalonians. We have to deal if we have to if it's, it's the cross, and in the church. And when you get to Thessalonians, it deals with the subject of the coming of the Lord. All right? And the timing of His coming. That's what the subject is in First and Second Thessalonians. So then we have the cross, we have the church, and in First and Second Thessalonians, we have the coming. The hope of the church. Faith, hope, or faith, love, and hope. It's laid out for us there in Paul. Perfectly, beautifully in the Pauline epistles. And you and I can learn from Romans to Philemon who we are, what we are, why we are what we are, what God is doing, why God has kept this a secret, and why He kept the revelation of the mystery a secret for so long and now revealed through the Apostle Paul because he had to keep it a secret because if he didn't keep it a secret, Satan and his princes would never have allowed the Lord Jesus Christ to be crucified. You and I today can have a relationship in spite of the nation of Israel can have a relationship with God directly through His his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we are made accepted in the Beloved. Once you and I are taken out, the book of Hebrews to Revelation is going to deal with God returning His program with the nation of Israel. And the book of Hebrews rightfully start off by the issue of, look who you have missed. Jesus was the very Christ. You missed Him. He was the high priest. He was the higher than angels. He was all these things for you. And he came and suffered and died once for all. You missed it, Israel. Be converted. And they will do that. From Hebrews to Revelation deals with God's returning of the program of getting Israel now ready to, and getting him into the land so that he can bless the world. And he will, you and I will be part of when we get into the heavenly places after the judgment seat of Christ which takes place shortly at, at or straight after that we've been caught up. We're going to meet the Lord in there, and we'll have a judgment seat of Christ there. Then we'll go into the heavens, and we'll take up those positions of, of, in our airship, in the positions of reigning in the heavenly places with Christ. Every member of the body of Christ will go up there and have a place and a function. 
And some of us will reigning. Some of us will be possibly reigning higher than others. Depends on the doctrine we've been built with. I don't know what the position is exactly, and I don't know what my position is going to be, so I'm not going to dare to say this is my position. If I look at my own walk and my own life and my own understanding, guess what? I don't think I'm going to be really tough, very high on the totem pole, okay? But that's not, you know. But I'm going to be in there, reigning in the heavenly places with Christ as a member of the body of Christ. Satan and his angels will be kicked out. You and I will be judging angels, by the way, says Corinthians. And Satan and his angels will be kicked out. And in the middle of that tribulation, he'll start his day of wrath. And then Christ Jesus comes back and have his day of vengeance. By the end of the seven years. Then he establishes the kingdom and he takes his throne over. And then he blesses for a thousand years. He reigns with the nation of Israel and blesses the world. And as some of the mention, people through this world are still going to turn because Satan will be loosed after a thousand years. And he will still then convince some of these nations in the kingdom to turn against Christ and his people. And God will ultimately destroy them and then we'll have the white throne judgment. And then ultimately we'll see the new heaven and new earth and all coming together in one. His ultimate purpose that he had in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth for his purpose. It started off with him creating it. And then he's created a host, part of his created host. The head cherubim, if you will, if you will rebelled. And then God in the process, right through Genesis to Revelation, is taking man, and by man he's going to reclaim all this authority back. And by the seed of man, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to take that authority, he's going to reconcile, go, go with me, Colossians. And we've read this verse a few times, and let me read it again to you, the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Look, no, sorry, let's go verse 15. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. That's ultimately the way they created, by Him and for Him. But we know that that creation rebelled. Verse 17 says, And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. Con consist. Verse 18, And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. He's first in rank. Verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in Him, that's in Christ, should all fullness dwell and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. All things had to be reconciled to himself. Not just things on the earth, but things in heaven as well. And God is, the Bible is about what God is doing and why God is doing what he's doing in his creation and, and, and it's about God using man and the seed of man by whom Christ is going to come into the world he's not going to be the seed in the sense of physical descendant of man but he will come into that seed line and miraculously God will come as a, in the form of man and he's going to come in and, to, and so that he can die on that cross and pay for the sin and, to, and, and, and for the sin of the world but also that he can reconcile things on earth and things in heaven to himself the cross is the central event by which God is going to do that to fulfill His ultimate purpose. You and I are part of the body of Christ today. You and I need to occupy till He comes. That word occupy till He comes is, is, is used in, in relation to the nation of Israel. You and I have to redeem the time because the days are evil that we're living in. And our job, we have seen God had a twofold purpose. He had a purpose for heaven, a purpose for the earth. And we know the rebellion takes place. Today, in the dispensation of God's grace, God also has a twofold purpose. 
And it's you and I as members of the body of Christ who's going to become part of the body. We have to take note of this purpose. T- turn with me to First Timothy. First Timothy, if you will. And in closing, First Timothy chapter 2. God has a twofold purpose today. Look at verse 1. I exhort therefore that first of all supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, things and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be what? Saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. God's in the business today, and His desire is for all men to be what? Saved. And then also come unto the knowledge of the truth. Saved men, only saved men can come to the knowledge of the truth. You can't come to the knowledge of the truth if you don't have the Spirit of God in you. Our job is out there to preach the gospel of His grace, the gospel of His salvation, the good news concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross. When men and men can get this, they can get into understanding God's word, right and divided, and see His ultimate purpose. Why are we here and what are we doing here? It's all in this book. And we're part of God's purpose. It's by Him and for Him. That's an awesome adventure. If we still look at our, you know, we use the word awesome adventures through the Scriptures. If we just think about ourselves as members of the body of Christ today, in this day and age that we're living, this is an awesome adventure. You know, we are so focused on our circumstances. We are so focused on the things of this world. We are so focused on the affections of this world that we, we sometimes, I think, lose sight of how awesome it is to living in a dispensation of God's grace where Gentiles were now, are now part of God's plan and purpose which you want to save and bring to the knowledge of the truth and make part of somebody that's going to go into the heavens by which he's going to reclaim his authority in heavenly places with us as a joint, not just heirs of him, but joint heirs with Christ. In the heavenly places, you and I are going to be there. That's awesome if you think about that. Now, if we think about my existence as a as somebody that just is a carpenter or somebody works on motorbikes or somebody that's a preacher or somebody that's painting houses or somebody that's working on the internet or somebody, what, and I think of myself, oh, well, this is what I do, this is my existence on earth. No, no, no. That is what I do so that I can stay focused on who I really am as somebody that's been made complete in Christ, as somebody that's been made acceptable in the beloved, who's been redeemed by His blood for an ultimate purpose is higher than ever we have think. If you and I think about our lives, you think, oh, what will I achieve in life? Really, it doesn't matter what I achieve in life. It's what God is going to achieve with me by His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we enter into the heavenly places and as we function and, and there for, 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 for eternity where time ceases to exist. That's awesome. You think about that. You want something awesome? That's awesome. You're part of that. I am part of that. We're part of what God is doing today. And He doesn't leave us without a manual. Here's His manual. Tell us what He's doing. We don't have to wonder. Before Paul came onto the scene, man could not understand what's in the heart of God and fully see and fully hear what God is doing. But since Paul came onto the scene and God's revealed to him the revelation of the mystery that completes the Word of God, now we can know. We can see. We can hear. It can enter into our heart. Before, we could not. Before Paul. The Word of God will not be complete without the Pauline epistles. Because Paul brings light into everything that God is doing. And brings it all together. Including, mainly, what are you going to do with us and you and I in the heavenly places. And how he prepares us to be able to do that. That's what Romans to Philemon is about. Isn't that awesome? That's you and I. And I trust that you'll be encouraged through this awesome adventure. I trust that those who's listening to the DVD and, 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 and listening to this message and following it, we know there's not a lot of meat that we've dealt with, but it's the overview and general overview so that you can get a grasp on the Word of God, what it's about. That you'll be edified by that and get excited about the awesomeness <laughs> of being part of this adventure as we... Enjoy the awesome adventures through the scriptures.
So much to be learned. So much to edify us. It's all in the Word of God. And we thank Him for that. Until then, we need to redeem the time until we get caught up. Okay? And let's comfort one another with His Word. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of great God our Savior, of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's looking forward to that? I know I am. I know I am. And I know you are. What a day that rejoicing that's going to be. Until, but until then, let's redeem the time. Until then, let's not lose focus of God's purpose and what God is doing. Father, we thank you this morning for your wonderful, undeserving grace showing us your love your mercy, your righteousness, and your grace. Thank you for your word that you've inspired, and not just inspired, but also preserved for us, that in the King James Bible today, we can hear and understand the truth of your word, that we can read about what you are doing and how we form part of that, that we're part of this one new man, the body of Christ today. In time past, we were without the hope of salvation without Christ and without God but now we have that through the finished work of your son the Lord Jesus Christ thank you for his blood that has redeemed us thank you for making us complete thank you for making us holy uh, uh, unblameable and unreprovable in your sight only because of your son and by your son we are thankful for this and praise you for this in Christ Amen Amen, thank you